We had twice as many people last week. Anyway, we'll give us uh, give you guys just a minute to get settled in. Uh, I say, brother buddy, I'm glad you can make it on time. You're you're welcome. You're welcome. It's not like you, we do this every week. You know, this is the first week we start this time or something. Yeah, all right. Let's take our Bibles this morning and go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And those of you that are sitting over here, I hope y'all, I don't think y'all can see the board, but I can't do it on both sides. And uh, maybe I should, uh, I don't know. I apologize, Brother Johnson. You guys can't see it. Do you guys want me to adjust it anyway? All right, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, and uh, we want to say a word of prayer and we'll get going this morning. And again, thank you guys for, uh, for being here. And uh, Brother Brett called me uh, this week and told me that I lied last Sunday and because uh, I said it was my last week teaching Sunday school. Well, that was his fault, so I want you all to understand that was Brett's fault, okay? All right, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. All right, now, <clears throat> this morning, uh, let's see, I'll tell you what, Jeremiah, how about you stand and pray for me this morning? Amen. All right, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Now, what I want to do is I want to do just a basic review over the last two weeks, take about a minute to do so before we get into this class this morning. And, and two weeks ago, I started with the, uh, the foundation about believing that He is and believing of the truth, and that's foundational. And that means that if, well, if a person doesn't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then he doesn't believe the truth, and that's foundational. You build a house from the ground up. Is everybody with me? And uh, not on feelings, but on faith, right? And then last week we talked about how to learn. We talked about how to learn, went through each letter of that, of that word, L-E-A-R-N. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to remind you guys about is that reading. Um, uh, Brother Micah reminded me about the verse in Psalm 119 about the word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Everybody remember that verse? Well, if you don't, if, so the verse, in, in, the verse gives us this indication is that it gives us light where we are and where we're going. But if you don't walk in the light where you are, you're not going to get to where you're going. And then we talked about, uh, when we read Deuteronomy chapter 17, we talked about our hearts not being lifted up and not turning to the right or the left. Now, the illustration I forgot last week I wanted to give you this week is the picture of the moon. Uh, out here, it's uh, where I live, man, you can see the, the, the uh, sunrises are beautiful and the sunsets are also beautiful. Uh, and this morning, at, uh, well, I, I figured if I, I was up at four this morning, I figured I could see the moon. I didn't see the moon uh, at, at all, from, so I don't know where it was. But, but you guys know that at times when you see the moon, it's awful big. Does everybody remember that? And it's awful bright, and what's in interesting about that, the moon doesn't rotate, doesn't turn to the right or to the left. And the lower it is, the brighter it is. Remember, the moon is a type of the church because it reflects the sun, the light of the sun. And so the lower, so that, what, that's my illustration about the more humble we are, the bigger we are, the brighter, but the higher the moon gets, the smaller it becomes and less light it gives off. So we need to remind ourselves God puts those things in, in, in creation to show us that we need to make sure we stay humble, okay? So this morning, uh, I have, uh, this is one of my favorite lessons, and I do have to make an apology before I get started. I usually teach this with a Koran on one side, which you would not see in a Baptist church. And a Book of Mormon on the other side. And with all our packing, I've been looking for days and could not find them. And uh, nobody else, ar else around here had one, so I apologize because it makes good for illustration purposes. But I do have two other things that I want to use this morning. And I know this is the right class because yesterday, I've been here almost six months, and I've not sent a Jehovah Witness uh, since I've been here, and then yesterday I saw him twice. 
And so it kind of gives us an indication that I'm going the right direction. Now, just for testimony's sake, Michael, you have what I need? Okay. For Just for testimony's sake, those of you that don't know us, I was not raised in church. I got saved when I was 23. And when I got saved, I couldn't hardly read. So now, all these years later, I'm teaching <laughs> the most amazing subject in all the world. Amen? And I'm very grateful to be doing that for you this morning. So, uh, as I, I'm going to read in just a second. So, this is uh, uh, when I started teaching world religions. Can you imagine a dumb Alabama boy uh, with about a 55 IQ now teaching on world religions? Kind of crazy, isn't it? So, when I started teaching world religions, there's so much ground to cover that it usually takes me about four months to go through the basics of it. So here's what I did. I asked the Lord for something very simple so anybody could follow and anybody could remember. So what separates us from all other religions is what we believe about the Scriptures, what we believe about the Son, and what we believe about salvation. These are very basic things. And it makes it so simple that anybody could follow. And I want to say this in getting started, and I'm going to come back and repeat this probably a hundred times today. If you get this off, you're going to get this off. And if you get this off, you're going to get this off. This is the foundation, right? All right, now, 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 16. This is a verse that you know, but I want to, I want to kind of lay the foundation for you, then I, we'll work our way through. Verse 16 says, all scripture, notice the word, is given by inspiration of God, not was. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So how much scripture? Talk to me. All of it. Now notice that in the Bible, the word scripture is always a reference to something that is written. Not something that you can't get access to. For some reason, I don't know you guys well enough, so I'll just shoot off the hip a little bit because I don't know if I'm talking to you or not. You don't need Greek and Hebrew to understand the Bible. And that goes for you educated people too. You can't explain it in your own language. You, I don't need you talking to me about another language. If I remember correctly, I think your life insurance policy is probably in your language, not another language. You're welcome. Now go back to the book of Psalms, chapter 68. This generation is, anyway, I uh, called a uh, preacher back in Georgia the other day to check on him. He's uh, 87 years old. He's not able to get out and go to church anymore. His wife is having memory problems. I mean, it's just a big battle for me just to listen to him. I sat there for 57 minutes listening to the old man preach at me. And he told me that when he started preaching 40 years ago, pre preachers got up and started saying, well, this word in the Greek is this, and this word in the Hebrew is this. And I want you all to understand something. Now, I don't know you, and I don't know who I'm talking to, and I hope I'm not talking to anybody. But I want you all to understand, this generation knows less about the Bible because preachers have become so educated. Uh, let, me, let me just say it this way. How come you go by all these churches and got doctor on the sign, doctor on the sign, doctor on the sign? You know why that is? Because the church is sick. I think y'all need to let that sink in a little bit. See, false doctrine is false doctoring. You give sick folks the wrong medicine. Is that a little too simple for y'all? You country people ought to understand what I'm saying. Psalm chapter 68. God forbid you leave the church and not know what the preacher's talking about. Psalm chapter 68, you there? Say amen. amen. All right, look down verse number 11. Psalm 68, verse number 11. The Lord gave the what? Say it. And great was the company of those that published it. So you would say publish and company. So I got this written up here to kind of explain some things as we go through here. I believe the scriptures like the sun has a divine side to it and a human side to it. The Lord gave the word, and great was the company of those that published it. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Everybody follow me? All right, one more time. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God gave the word, Jeremiah spoke the word, and Baruch wrote the word. 
Are you with me? God used human elements. You say, why? Well, the outside of this thing is flesh. I said, the outside of this thing is flesh. What's inside is what matters. <laughs> now, as I go through this, I want you to, I want you to understand that in, up here I've got a, a New World Translation. This is the Jehovah Witness quote Bible. And this is my authentic papal edition Catholic Bible. Look at this thing. I wonder, Brother Gary, if this thing's worth some money. Anyway, so what I want to do is I want to read you, I want to read you some things in this uh, about what these guys say about the scriptures first of all, and then we'll cover some more verses. Now listen closely. The collection of the list of books that belong in the Bible, only those books which God has inspired belong to the Bible. But the question is, which books are they, and how do they know for sure that these books are inspired books of the Bible and that others are not? The present-day Jewish Old Testament canon differs from the Catholic canon. Amen. And does the Protestant canon. Now, this, this book has all their... I mean, the reason it's so big is it's got a dictionary and, and all their sacraments and all this, this stuff in the back. And, and then it's got those seven extra books in this one, okay, that you don't have in yours. And so they're, they're admitting... When they say this, that the canon of the Old Testament in the Jewish and in the Protestant is different than theirs, meaning they do not have uh, these extra books in here. Now listen to this closely at the end. It is the teaching authority of the Catholic Church that the world owes the complete Bible as it stands today. Now as we go through these things this morning, you'll realize that these guys say that they're the only ones that have the truth and if you're not involved in their issue, then you're not going to heaven. Okay? Now I'm going to read the verses to you in just a minute and the things that they say. I want you to understand how important this is. All right, now let's go to John chapter number 1. Real quick like, John chapter 1. I wanted to get you to read the verses. So what separates us from all other religions, regardless of what where they fall under, is what we believe about the Scriptures, what we believe about the Son, and what we believe about salvation. Now, when you witness, you'll find people believe in Thor. It's now become a big thing. I don't know how much what you're smoking, but uh, it isn't real. Do you understand? You can watch all the Avengers you want to watch. Uh, <laughs> never mind. The Incredible Hulk is not real. <laughs> Zach used to argue with the boys about who was stronger, Spider-Man or the Incredible Hulk or Thor. And I went, Zach, you realize they're not real, son. Anyway, John chapter number 1, John chapter number 1, I know you know the verse, but I want to read it to you so you can see that I'm not just making this stuff up. Now, look at John chapter number 1, verse number 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, notice the capital W, and the Word was with God, now notice this statement, and the Word was, say it, okay, now in this New World Translation, and my other one, it was beat up because I've used it so much, but thankfully I had another one. Now this is John chapter 1. I got it highlighted for you. So I'll read it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a little G-O-D. Now listen to me closely. Things that are different are not the same. So when you witness or talk to a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness or a Catholic or or even, anyway, I'm trying to be nice, is that just because they say they believe in Jesus doesn't mean it's the same Jesus you believe in. Okay? Now, let's, let's see if we got this right. Go to the back of your Bible to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter number 5. So what are these new Bibles going to do? They're going to attack the deity. Y'all look, look at me. They're going to attack the deity, the divine side of Jesus Christ. Now look at 1 John chapter 5 in the back of your Bible, sometimes called Little John. 1 John chapter 5, and the reason I want you to look at it, 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 7. Are you there? Say amen. amen. All right, it says, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father. Notice that word again, Word, capital W, and these three are what? 
In the begin, come on now. There are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are set. All right. You don't add them; you multiply them. That's how one times one times one is one. So in First John chapter five in this Bible, don't y'all listen closely? The year says this. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Not verse 7, verse 7, for there are three witness bearers, verse 8. That's all it says right there. Now, Brother Freddie, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is, is that what separates us from all other religions is what these guys believe about the Scriptures and what they believe about the Son. If you have this off, you have this off, and if you have the sun off, you've got salvation wrong. Now listen to me. I'm trying to make this as simple as I can for you. Now let me illustrate in case you're not following me so far. <clears throat> Hopefully you got something in your pocket that looks like, looks like a coin. Uh, this coin has two sides, but it's one. One side, and then you have another side. That's why Jesus Christ has a God side, and He has a man side. And if Jesus Christ ain't God, you're all going to hell. Every last one of you. You say, why? Because no man, for all have sinned, and... Uh, <laughs> And come short of the glory of God. And because of that sin passed on every man. But when it got to Jesus Christ. You get the sin nature from your father's side. I mean your mother's side. I mean your father's side. Come on now. Y'all you need to listen. <clears throat> One of my favorite stories is when uh, Jesus is in the temple at 12 years old. And. Those guys are asking him these questions. Jesus is answering those questions at 12 years old. I wonder if one of them asked him how old he was. Well, do you mean on my mother's side? Or do you mean on my father's side? Man, some of y'all ain't getting this. Think about sitting there and you're looking at a 12-year-old. He's answering all your questions. He has all the first five books memorized because he gave it. And then you look at him and ask him how old he is. I'm like, well, you're talking about on mama's side, you're talking about on daddy's side. Hey, man. All right, now let's, uh, let's do this. Let's go to um, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, back to the left here. 1 Timothy chapter 3. It is important, beloved, that you know what you believe and why you believe it. And I don't mean because the preacher said, or your mother and daddy said, or how you were raised. What you need to know is what God said. Because I promise you, all these Christians don't got it right. I'm still under the pers persuasion, what I gave you two weeks ago, that people believe in God, but they don't believe God. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. The Bible says in verse 16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Tell me who was manifest in the flesh. Talk to me. Who was? Uh, is that clear? Does everybody have trouble understanding that? Nobody has. Because the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So when you read this, it says this, Indeed, the sacred secret of this godly devotion is admittedly great. Yeah, that's easier to understand. He was made manifest in the flesh. Well, who's He? You say, well, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. Moses and Elijah were manifest in the flesh. But Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. You don't, don't you understand that when these guys attack these things, they attack the deity of Jesus Christ. And listen to me, if He's not God, it's all over. Uh, now, let me, let, me give you, let me give you another illustration of this. Uh, let's see, go to first, while we're in 1 Timothy, look at chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
Now, I may, I may do a little kicking this morning in some of this stuff, but it's different when I'm witnessing. And I would suggest that being around this crowd long enough, uh, there's probably some of you who were raised Catholic. Now, once you get converted, you realize how erroneous and how wrong, in some cases, how wicked that is. I have led people to Jesus Christ that have gotten mad less than two minutes after getting saved after all the lies they've been given their whole life. But when you're witnessing to a Catholic, you don't need to beat up Mary or beat up none of that stuff. You, you use what they understand about it to win them. Then you can kick Mary later. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Look down in verse number 4. Who will have all men to be saved? God's not a Calvinist. That was extra. The coming of the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, when you look at this Catholic Bible, and it, when it gives this thing about Mary, some of this stuff whew, is so paganistic and wicked, they even call her the Queen of Heaven in here. Now, if you've ever read your Bible, you realize that the Queen of Heaven in the book of Jeremiah... <laughs> Not a good thing. So anyway, so it gets down to here when it's talking about Mary and all this paganistic panning stuff. Crown queen of heaven, she is given a place of honor beside her son. Saints and angels approach to offer homage, homage to, the, to their queen, the angels. While the artist chooses this scene for the final episode... Having received as us all her wards from her son dying on the cross, listen, she is now our mother in the, I can't even say that word, of all graces. At the heavenly throne she intercedes for us, and through her maternal hands all graces are dispensed to us. And I'm going to try to be as nice as I possibly can. But Mary can't hear you, she can't help you. Okay, now watch. So when you read this, you know what they say? Watch. Is Jesus God? Is Jesus God? Talk to me. Is Jesus God? Talk to me. Okay, so she's the mother of God. See? See how they word it? No, no. She's not the mother of God. She's the mother of the man. Are you following me? She's not the mother of God. God has always been. Remember Jesus talking to the Pharisees before uh, Abraham was, I am? I don't know if you realize or not. He's sticking it in there. Art thou yet 50 years old? Art thou, <laughs> has thou seen Abraham? Well, bless God, he's more than you realize, honey. Now, so she is the mother of the man. She is not the mother of God. She gave birth to the man. Now look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter number 1, please, real quick like. Matthew chapter 1. Now, if you're new here, I don't know everybody yet. If you don't have a King James Bible, you've got the wrong Bible for the English-speaking people. And I don't have time to go through all that this morning. I promise you I would do it all day. Listen to me, promise of preservation given by inspiration, the act of translation. And I just want to say this, just in case you're educated and you've been to school somewhere and you somehow figure that God can create the world, save you from hell, but somehow He can't preserve His Word. You're not even saved. How are you going to trust God to keep you forever when you can't even believe He can keep His Word? Think about what I'm saying. Now look at Matthew chapter number 1. I don't know if you know this or not, but every translation in the Bible is better than the original. That's a little tough for some of y'all. Enoch was translated, he shall not see death. The kingdom was translated from Saul to David. And you were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Hey, you may have gotten something a little better in the translation. Anyway. You can call me a heretic all you want. I don't care. Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 25. Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 25. Verse 25 says this, And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. 
All right, back to the uh, Jehovah Witness Bible. Well, whatever it is. Matthew chapter number 1 and verse number 25. I'm not going to say this one word because it's not, but he had no relations with her, I'll use that word, until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. What's missing? What's missing? Firstborn is missing. Let me ask you a question. If somebody pays you with a fake $100 bill, wouldn't you be upset? Then why does it not bother you these Bibles are missing all this? The problem with most Christians is they don't know the real thing and they can't spot the fake thing when they see it. You know what these new Bibles do? See how it's written? It's written in paragraph form. You know why they do that? So when they leave out a verse, you don't know it's missing. You ever read Acts chapter number 8? where he's getting saved, and he said, does thou believe in the Son of God? He said, I believe with all thy heart thou mayest. That whole verse is missing. Now look at Matthew chapter 18. I'll just give you an extra one right here. Look at Matthew chapter 18. Real quick lot. Matthew chapter number 18. Real quick lot. You have to know the truth in order to spot a lie. I don't know how it is here, but in the South, everybody reads everything under the sun, then they pick out what they like. There's no such thing as soul sleep. Uh, purgatory isn't real. The rich man died and was buried and in the hell. He lifted up his eyes and Lazarus was carried into Abraham's bosom. Before Calvary, you have hell and you have Abraham's bosom. Now you have hell and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the difference. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, real quick lot. Uh, I think it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to say that which was lost. Is that right? All right, so in this book right here, and I'll use the word book, it's missing altogether, that verse. Let me ask you a question. Is that verse important? Talk to me. Is that verse? Y'all watch too much TV. I said, Is it important? Yes. Okay, so why would you read something that leaves it out? Given by God, corrupted by man. See, in the hills of Georgia, the, you know, I don't, I, I'm pretty sure that these guys that, uh, that uh, they get this bottled water you drink, it comes out of the mountains or out of fresh springs. When you go up in the North Georgia mountains, that water is just as clear and as cold, and you can put a tester in it. It's as clean, but by the time it gets down to Atlanta and goes through that sewer, the water's been corrupted. God gave the word, it's corrupted by man. You say, why? Because you don't believe it to begin with. And if you got the scriptures off, you got the sun off, and you certainly got salvation wrong. It's very important that you know what you believe to be true and know why that is. Now, let me give you another example. Go back to the book of Daniel chapter 3, real quick lot. Daniel chapter number 3. Always attack on the deity. The church fathers, those earlier guys like Ori, Origen, I hate even using their names, Eusebius and all, some of these guys, they were all baby sprinklers, they were all pagans, and none of them believed in the deity of Jesus Christ. I may not can explain it, but I do believe it. Now look at Daniel chapter number 3. Daniel chapter number 3. Just to give you another idea of how crazy this goes, I ought to just do the thing about the devil, but I'm going to leave that off. I'll get way out, out there if I do that. Daniel chapter number 3. Daniel chapter number 3, and look down in verse number 25. Daniel chapter 3, and verse number 25. He said, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now how about that revelation way back there in the book of Daniel? So where did he get that from? Probably reading the book of Proverbs. What is his name? What is his son's name? But in Daniel chapter 3, in this trash... As he said, beholding four able... Look, just because you find money in a trash can doesn't mean it's a bank. And just because you can find some truth in here doesn't mean it's a Bible. Well, 
able to fire some of you up. He said, I see four able-bodied men walking about free in the midst of fire, and there is no hurt to them. And the appearance of the fourth one is resembling a son, little s, of the little g gods. You say, why do they do that? Because they don't believe it. They don't believe it. All right, now, let's go to the book of Ephesians real quick. Like, oh, we're doing great on time. Ephesians chapter number 1, real quick. Ephesians chapter number 1. Now, I'll tell you how I got this direction. After I got saved, the Lord had me witness to every crazy person under the sun. If you witness to a Hindu in Alabama, you're doing something. And this guy was standing on the corner uh, late at night, and I'm just talking about standing, I guess he was waiting on a ride, so, you know, you're, you're free game. You're standing out in, the middle of the, you know, out in the middle of the road, so I pulled up and tried to witness to him, and this guy threw all kind of crazy stuff at me. I'd only been saved six or eight months. I didn't know how to answer the guy. All I said in those days, well, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. That was my answer. Well, I didn't have no Bible. All I knew was is that if you're not saved, you're going to hell. Amen? You still believe that? <laughs> the first Mormon I witnessed to, he told me that Jesus and the devil were brothers. I laughed in the guy's face. I said, you can't believe that. So whatever you're smoking must be some good stuff. Out of Ephesians 1 verse 13. Ephesians 1, probably the tailpipe on the car. Verse 13. In whom you also trusted. All right, when did you do that? After that you heard the word of truth. All right, what was the truth? The gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye baptized, joined the church. Did good works. After ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, I know this is simple to some of y'all, but do you understand that 90% of the people you talk to, they believe in some kind of faith and works? Do they not? Come on, talk to me. You say, why? Because they got this off. And when you have this off, you had this off. Somehow you can figure, you can work your way in. Look, you're not working your way into heaven. You're going to work your way into hell. It doesn't work like that. When Jesus died on the cross, I think I remember him saying, it is finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, it is finished. <laughs> yep, man. I, you tell you what's wild. Uh, over his head, is a subscription written in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin for all the world. <laughs> and so I can imagine that one of them boys are pushing up that last time to breathe before they die. That guy looks above his head and says, This is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Shall I crucify your king? They didn't believe, but that thief must have believed what was written. And they said to him, don't write that he's the king of the Jews. Write that he said he was the king of the Jews. He said, what I've written, I have written. Man, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The Lord says, remember you, I'm going to take you with me. Can you imagine the Lord dying and downstairs? He said, well, we've got to, we're waiting on somebody. Just give me a few more minutes. All right, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter number 2. Man, the wonderful thing about salvation is you don't have to be good enough. Now, I know some of you are raised right. Your sin may not be as bad as my mind. And it doesn't matter how deep you're in the pool. You're still in the pool. It doesn't matter how deep you were in sin. You're still in sin. Come on now, talk to me. Anyway, Ephesians chapter number 2. I know you know the verses, but watch. Verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What is gift? Grace, salvation, and faith. It's all gift. God even gives you the faith to believe. Now think about it. Here's a dumb Alabama boy. The Lord's working on him about being saved. And then I ask some crazy question like, Well, how'd the Lord know I'd be here 2,000 years later and die for me? Well, he didn't have some fancy answer. He just said, well, he just did. I said, well, okay, good good enough for me. 
You, think, you know how amazing it is for God to tell Abraham, you see all those stars? He goes, yep. He goes, well, you're going to have as many. So shall thy seed be. And Abraham said, God, did you say that? He goes, I said that. He goes, well, then I believe it. He goes, well, I'll tell you what, if you'll believe something that wild, I'll give you my righteousness. So here I am 2,000 years later. You mean this dumb Alabama going, want to believe a Jew died for him 2,000 years ago? You said it, didn't you? Well, yes, I did. Well, you said you'd save me, so I'm asking. He goes, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my righteousness. <laughs> you ain't going to get in by yours. You better have his. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Verse 9, not of works, lest any fool should boast. That's the Freddie Young version. All right, look at Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Some of your witnessing has become mechanical over the years instead of personal. Well, if you die today, you know you'd go to heaven. Why, Why don't you learn how to witness? Why don't you stop all this mechanical nonsense and get personal people? They don't want to hear your nonsense. You don't even believe what you're saying. All these colleges, these guys are pushing, they get somebody to pray a prayer and they think they're saved. Yeah, I could call names. I'm just telling you, there ain't nothing about that. Nothing about that, scriptural or practical or personal. I was asked to do a vacation Bible school one time to little kids. And there was a five-year-old girl in there, Brother Gary, that got under conviction and wanted to be saved. I said, honey, you're too young to be saved. You don't understand. Because I've just always been real sensitive with kids. And by the way, if you have little kids, you don't have to push them. If God's dealing with them, I promise you they won't leave you alone. When Michael, when the well, Lord was dealing with Michael, he was six years old, Brother Gary. I don't even fathom how you could understand it at six years old. All his life, he had heard Jesus died, Jesus died. But when he made that connection that he died for him, it was a different game. I even told him to go to bed. We'll take care of this tomorrow. And he goes, no, Dad, we've got to take care of this now. I can remember where he was at, where he was praying. <laughs> I mean, it was a, when he got up, he goes, i got to call my mom and tell her I got saved. How you can get saved at six and never struggle with it, I have no idea. So, Brother Gary, I got down on my knees in front of that five-year-old girl, and I said, Honey, you don't even know what sin is. And she told me. I said, Honey, have you sinned? She went, Yes. And I went, So so what's going to take care of your sin? She goes, Jesus dying for my... Five years old. And she told me more than I knew. I couldn't tell her No. Suffer the little children to come? I believe that's a little biblical. So here's here's what I'm saying. Is that witnessing ought to be personal, not mechanical. Stop repeating a bunch of things and be personal with people. Anyway, Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man (laughs) is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So you want to tell me how good you are? Really? Really? Well, all these have I kept from my youth up. Well, the Lord left out a couple on purpose. See, that guy came up to the Lord, and he goes, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord went through that list. I'm like, you left out some on purpose. He goes, well, I've done all these. And the Lord said, well, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and follow me because I'm going to the cross. Because his first God was, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That was his wealth. And that last one was, thou shalt not covet. He left those two out. Because that was his God's. Mm. I felt something on that one. Now, I want you to understand. I know you know all this. I know you know all this. But don't you listen to this. You listen to this stuff. 
Now it has a heading in the back that says this, Outside the Church No Salvation. And it says this, A theological axiom which means that a membership in the church founded by Christ is necessary for salvation of every individual man. Since the Roman Catholic Church is the church founded by Christ, which is not true at all, and we're going to talk more about this when we get to Revelation chapter 17, and I promise you it'll hair lip some of y'all. Since the Roman Catholic Church is the church founded by Christ, that's not true at all. Peter couldn't be a pope, he was married. Catholic theologians have commonly held that many of those who are outside the church through no fault of their own, really, no, I choose to be outside, can be saved by doing God's will as they see it. Uh, chapter and verse? No. No chapter, no verse. This axiom is revealed truth which must be believed by Catholics, but it must be understood in the sense of which the church understands it, not according to personal interpretation of any individual. Only the church can do that. The axiom means that Christ commands all men to be baptized into the Catholic church and remain therein united to the Pope, who is the vicar of Christ on earth, Hence, anyone knowing of the strict command of Christ and refusing to obey it cannot be saved. All men are not only commanded to join the church, but Christ has made the Catholic church the means by which they are to enter into heaven. The church is necessary means of salvation, not because of any intrinsic necessity. Christ could have arranged other means of salvation. Uh, he did called Jesus, but solely because it was so established by Christ. Now, now I want you to listen to me before I, before I try to finish up this, this morning. And I'm, I'm really trying to be nice. I do not want to be. Now, do you understand? You say, why are you so upset? Millions of people are going to hell because they're listening to a priest or a preacher who don't tell them to read the Bible. And some of you are in the same state. You've been raised in church. Your whole, all you've done is believe what the preacher said. What if he lied to you? I got Catholics in Georgia that I witnessed to, and <laughs> they're not even good Catholics. <laughs> some of y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. A good Catholic prays every day. Some of you don't even do that. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I need to stop. I need to stop. And they'll say to me, I'll say, "Well, are you a saved Catholic?" They go, well, "What do you mean by that?" I said, "Have you ever put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ?" Well, I talk to my priest every week. I said, can your priest save you? Well, he said he can. Now, y'all know that none of that biblical. Now, listen to me. Some of you still have family that are Catholic you need to witness to. Because if they believe what their church is teaching them, they're going to end up in hell. Listen to me now. Listen. And it doesn't matter if they're friend or family. If they believe that, they can't be saved. You say, why? Because he took care of it. It's very important. I, I mean, let me give you a couple of statements before I finish. You need to know what you believe and why you believe it. They believe in God, they don't believe God. I think the blood makes us safe, His Word makes us sure. All right, I want you to put this blood on the doorpost. Well, God says, when I see that, I will pass over you. Do you understand, if this book, if this book isn't true from cover to cover, then you have no hope at all. Now, I was going to do the Koran. I wished I had it with me. But I can quote it, but I don't remember. Let's see, I can give you some of them. The references in the, in the book of Sarah, or Sarah. And here's what the... Here's what the, 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 the Quran teaches. The Quran teaches this, is that Jesus was just a prophet. He's called Issa in the book in the Quran. The Quran calls us the followers of the book. I am guilty. Amen. And when they say don't let the followers of the book deceive you, they say Allah, Allah has no son. It's impossible for him to have a son. It even goes on to say that he was not crucified on a tree. So one day, I mean, in downtown Atlanta, you don't want to witness the Muslims down there. They'll get in your face and scream and yell. 
I mean, I've had it happen many, many times. Preaching on the street down there, these goons are across the street. They're up on a platform. they got two guys standing in front of them. And I, Brother Gary, and I'm wailing at them. They're saying their stuff, and I'm preaching right back at to them. And an older black gentleman walks up to me. He goes, son? And I said, yes, sir. He said, don't waste your time doing that. He said, just preach Jesus. And walk right on by. And I went, that'd probably work. Got me out. Got you out. <laughs> so I'm, uh, we, were at a, we were at a store one day, and this guy pulls up. He was very polite. His daddy was a Muslim. His mother was a Christian. And he said, well, I'm kind of sitting on the fence. I said, well, well, usually when you're sitting on the fence, you usually fall off on the wrong side. And I said, you can't, you can't have both because both of them are not saying the same thing. Now, I want you to listen to me. When someone says there are peaceful Muslims and all this stuff the same, it is not the same. The only reason that they're peaceful is they're just waiting for the opportunity. Anyway, I need to leave that stuff alone. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, real quick lot. So he was very polite to me, let me talk to him. I gave him both sides of the coin, and I said, Now look, you're going to have to choose one of these days, and I hope you choose wisely. Because what you do with Jesus will determine what God does with you. I, I think our witnessing is a little watered down at times. I don't think people need to, people need to leave you thinking, Well, I'm, I'm doing okay. They're not doing okay. I, uh, I was working on a real high dollar house one time and, and these people literally were drinking their drinks with their pinky out. Drinking their wine, liquor, whatever they were doing. I was trying to talk to them while I was laying brick, Brother Gary. <clears throat> and this lady says to me, so you're telling me that if somebody's on death row and they turn to Jesus and ask him to save him, that God will forgive all, everything they did. I said, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is that what not happened to the thief? Come on now. She goes, I don't believe that. I've never murdered nobody. Well, your sins is what put Jesus on the cross. You are a murderer. Matthew chapter 16, verse 14. And they said some that, they said that, excuse me, they said some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Do you know what Muslims say about Jesus? That he's just a prophet. If Jesus is not more than a prophet, you're all in trouble. Amen. Amen. Now, all right, let me, I need to stop. So let me remind you one more time. What separates us from all, all other religions is what we believe about the scriptures what we believe about the Son, and what we believe about salvation. I think that at times what blows me away is that Jesus can restrain His deity, and at times He lets it out. How about when Judas and them come to get Him? They go, who are you looking for? Well, we're looking for Jesus. He goes, well, I am He. And as soon as He said, I am He, they fell backwards. And then you're going to get up and still come after Him. Peter's going to pull a sword out trying to knock somebody's head off, cut a guy's ears off, he's going to pick it off the ground and put it back on, and you're still not going to believe. Look, miracles alone do not bring real disciples. That's why Jesus said, Thomas, you have seen and believed, but blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. So one more time, you get the scriptures wrong, you get the son wrong, you get the son wrong, you get salvation wrong. And that's why as a teacher and as a student, you need to understand the simplicity of this. You say, why? Because you're building a foundation and you're building your life on top of it. All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed for break. Father, thank you for the privilege to teach this morning. Thank you for the... Uh, Attention of your people, Lord, help us to be more excited about what you've done in our life. Help us to be more of a bold witness for you everywhere we go. Thank you for the 
reception in this town, the tracts and giving out stuff. We pray you'd bring forth some good fruit for it. Bless these people as they go their way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys take a break. Jeremiah, you guys come help get this up.